Well, um, you know, in light of everything that I've just said, I want you guys to remember that this is a judgment-free zone, okay? All right? There's no judgment. There's no harassment. And um, I say all that to say I have a confession to make. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 36 years old. When I was growing up, when I was about middle school age, I lived in Bridgeton, um, hard streets of Bridgeton. You know, many of you are aware the evil that happens on the other side of the bridge. You know, you pass that bridge and just, you're basically in the ghetto, you know. And so, um, but in, in that time period in my life in middle school, um, it was the rise of popularity of a certain uh, rapper from Detroit known as Eminem. And um, I thought I was the real Slim Shady, okay? Um, my mother is here. She can testify to this. Um, there may be or may not be pictures of me with a big yellow FUBU jersey on, um, baggy Jinko jeans, and a gigantic silver, fake silver Superman medallion around my neck. And uh, it wasn't uncommon for people to see me at the mall in Bridgeton and say, FUBU. And I'm like, yeah, for us, by us, brother. Um, I almost got beat up several times. But um, back to Eminem. You know, Eminem, he wrote this song that if you're, again, you're my age, you're probably very familiar with this. But you remember 8 Mile, when the movie 8 Mile came out? And it was kind of, you know, roughly based on, you know, Eminem's upbringing in Detroit and 8 Mile and everything else. And so he wrote this song called Lose Yourself. You've probably heard it before. Very popular song. And really, I love, I love to work out to this song, right? And there are many people in this room that remember this song. And, you know, we grew up in such an angsty, weird, you know, time period where we were just angry. I think just to, I don't know, just to be angry at times, you know. So a lot of people in this room, teenagers, a lot of your parents in this room, they spend a lot of time with a hood over their head, staring at themselves deeply in the mirror, being angry, you know. We'd either do that and then we'd go to Hot Topic and buy weird stuff, you know, and stuff. So, but, you know, this song, Lose Yourself, I remember the song. I, I, I'll be, I love working out to this song. I mean, this is a good, when you start to hear that little riff on that guitar, it's time to work out. And so I, I, I love this song, but I, I'm writing the series and stuff. And, you know, we've been talking about what winning looks like and, you know, thinking about how to how kind of redefine what winning looks like and stuff. So I'm, I'm looking through things, you know, through these, you know, different lenses because I'm writing the series and stuff. And so we were at the gym, CrossFit 70, and this song comes on. And I'm listening to the lyrics kind of for the first time. You know, I'm really paying attention to them. And so I wanted to share these lyrics with you because this is what the song is about. So in the song, Eminem, he says, His hole's escaping through this hole that is gaping. This world is mine for the taking. Make me king as we move toward a new world order. A normal life is boring. So he's talking about this hole that's inside of him, right? This, this gap that's gaping, this thing that needs to be filled, this void. And he goes, you know, a normal life is boring boring and everything. And then he says this a little bit later on. He goes, stay in one spot. Another day of monotony has gotten me to the point. I'm like a snail. I've got to formulate a plot or end up in jail or shot. Success is my only bleeping option. Failures not. That is the most white way to read the Eminem's lyrics on the face of the planet. <laughs> Like, I can hear it, you know what I mean? And, like, it's starting to catch me. But did you see how I resisted to not go that direction and embarrass myself? And instead, I just, Mr. Roger, white guy, read that, okay? Um, I'm very proud of myself. First service got a huge laugh out of that uh, because I looked dumb. Anyway, um, maybe next week, me and Michael will get up and do a little. No, we're not. No, I'm just kidding because I know Michael would love that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Michael and Michael can be a whole thing. Anyway, focus, Michael. Anyway. This song, like if you get down to the lyrics of it, right, this, this, this song is all about this, this void that needs to be filled, this thing that is there that's gaping that needs to be filled. And he says, you know, a normal life is boring, right? I mean, a normal life is not winning. you got to be great. And, and, and mediocrity, oh, reject mediocrity, re reject monotony. I need something more. And so you know what? I've got to grab this opportunity. And failure, failure is not an option. I've got to win. I mean, even our generation, we've got a whole song about that, right? Win, 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 no matter what, right? You know what song I'm talking about. I don't even know the lyrics after that. But that's what it says. Win, 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 no matter what. That's what our generation grew up with, grew up on. And many of that's reflected in our lives today and how we feel and how we live our lives. I mean, some of, some of you men, 
Maybe you can identify with this. You grew up in these households where that's what it was all about. You got to win. You got to win every game. You got to take every opportunity. You know, don't be a sissy. You got to be strong. You don't, don't you dare be afraid. You know, to, to quote the great prophet, Ricky Bobby, uh, <laughs> if, if you're not first, you're last. Okay? And some of you, Ricky Bobby's dad was your dad, Okay? If you were being a sissy, he probably would have put a live cougar in your car and told you to deal with it. (laughs) Again, there's so many young people first service that were so lost. And I was like, just ask your folks about it when you get home. Uh, But, you know, men, guys, we we grew up on on some of this idea, right? Like, if you're not first, you're last. Come on, you got to go. And then women, man, you know, women, you guys have it 10 times harder than men. Amen, ladies? Yep, there it is. All right, you know, you guys, you guys have it so much worse because in our culture today, there's so much pressure on you. I mean, number one, you've got to be a great mom, which today, being a great mom is like, that means being a great chauffeur, isn't it, ladies? I mean, you got to be a great chauffeur. chauffeur. You got to be a great cook. You got to do all these things to care for your family and take care of your family. You got to be a great wife. There's all these expectations of you. And here's the thing. Used to be generations ago, I'm going to get to some crazy statistics in this next series that we're going to talk about, especially for women. I mean, you guys are just, you guys are moving up a hill. It's so incredibly crazy. But it used to be that it was just about like, hey, women, be a great wife, be a great mom, and you know, you're, you're spectacular. But now, today, in our generation, it's so much more than that because, because of our economy, there's so many of you women that that have careers and have jobs, and you can't afford to just, you know, be a stay-at-home mom or anything like that, and so you're in a whole nother boat. There's a whole nother thing going on, so now not only do you got to be a great mom and and, and, and a great uh, great wife, but now you've got to, you know, wrestle through this whole new thing of, of having a career and all the stuff that happens there because then there's all this other stuff that's going on. There's ageism, there's sexism, and you're just trying to earn respect and, and, and earn positions. And then there's the pay gap. Let's not even start with the pay gap that still ex- exists and is ridiculous and stuff. But then I was reading research um, by Catalyst Research, and there's a new thing that they say women are up against that men don't have to deal with. And they've, even, they've given it a word. And the word is lookism. Lookism, ageism, sexism, lookism. And lookism is a standard for beauty and attractiveness. So not only do you guys have to be all of these great things, but all along the way, you've got to deal with the standard of beauty and attractiveness that, let's just be frank, all these other guys don't have to deal with, right? I mean, all these guys get to run around with their beer bellies and their butt cracks out, and they get promotions and leadership positions and all these things, while you women are trying to have to take care of this stuff. Amen, ladies, all right? Yeah, Jackie's she's like, testify, right? Anyway. <laughs> We love you, though, Daryl. Uh, but, you know, you women are against uh, all of this stuff, and it's just, it's ridiculous. And here's the thing. What is it that we're trying to win? What is it that Eminem really wanted to win? Really, it's all the same things. It's human beings, not even in America, but across the world. What we're all trying to win is affection, admiration, appreciation. These are the things that we want. But here's the crazy thing, Okay. We want all of these things, affection, admiration, appreciation. We want all of these things, and we fight so hard to do this. And if we could get that, we would be winning at life. But what's so crazy is that, I mean, I know all of you pretty well. Most of you, I know probably your situation, and I know what Lincoln County and St. Charles County are like. The crazy thing is, is that most of you are winning at life. Most of you, you've got great lives. I mean, most of you, you've got, you've got fantastic husbands, right? No amens. Okay, well, no amens. Not in one. But most of you, you've got fantastic husbands. Do, uh, we do a marriage retreat in February. You should probably sign up for that now. Uh, but most of you, you have great husbands or you got great wives. Yes, smart boy. Smart boy, good job. You got great wives, you got great kids, right? A lot of you, you got great kids. Wow, kids more, okay, we got got so much work to do. Anyway, 
more things to write down. Uh, but, and you got great careers. I mean, I know what some of you guys do. You guys, some of you guys have fascinating jobs and you're, you're good at them. Like you're successful at them. Like you, you've got great success and you've got houses and you guys, guys, you guys get to do some of the coolest trips. I mean, I Facebook stalk some of you guys and you guys have like some of the coolest trips in the world. It's so cool. I go, pastors go on vacation. We just go to uh, kids camp is where we get to go. But you guys get to do such cool things and you guys have such cool stuff. You have beautiful houses. I've never been invited to your house, but I'd like to be because you guys have beautiful houses and beautiful cars and you got campers attached to, to cars and some of you guys got horses and dragons and all kinds of cool stuff. Like you guys, you guys have incredible lives. It's amazing. But isn't it funny how successful you are and how awesome you are and how good looking you are too. By the way, you guys are, so, you guys are the best looking church that I've ever pastored at. And the other one was Nebraska and boy, they missing some teeth. But anyway, <laughs> but you guys have all of this winning that you're doing and yet you don't feel like winners. Isn't it true that if we kind of took a poll of the room, kind of took the temperature of the room, that a lot of us, the word we would identify the most it's tired? I mean, some of you even this morning. I mean, you guys have been up a little bit longer than the 9 a.m. service, but it's only 11 o'clock right now, and you, you're tired? I mean, some of us, that's how we feel. And for all the winning we've done, all the great things we have in life, the great family we have, the great spouse we have, the great career we have, the great things that we've attained and we've purchased and we're responsible for and all the accolades and all the titles and all that stuff, at the end of the day, we still don't feel like winners. At the end of the day, we would describe ourselves as feeling tired. You know, statistically, they did a big research thing on this. This is the number one word that 90% of college kids use today to describe how they feel. Tired. And again, if you're my age, you're looking at them and going, uh, if you're 22 and you feel tired, <laughs> you don't know what's ahead, right? I mean, you're like, really? But that's, how, that's what people associate with. Okay, so if that's the case, then maybe our approach towards winning isn't actually working. But what if, what if I could show you another way? What if I could pay for you a different path that would lead to exactly what you want, that would lead to affection, admiration and appreciation. W what if I could show you a different way and a different way forward and a different path to follow that would leave you feeling full, that could fill that void that Eminem was talking about, that hole that is gaping. Maybe, just maybe, there's another way there. But if you're just joining us, we're in part two of a series called Winning Winning at life. And we're talking about our, a guide to how to win at life. And we've kind of been trying to redefine what winning is. Because again, like I just talked about, we all feel this pressure to win at all the things. To be the best at all the things. It's not good enough to just have one thing we're good at. We need, we need to be the best among all of the things. And we really want people's appreciation and admiration and all of this stuff. And so last week, I, I, I gave you a question. That maybe, maybe the question we all need to ask that I think can help us get where we actually want to go is this question right here. What breaks your heart? What is it that breaks your heart? When you see it, you, it bothers you. It stirs your emotions. When you hear about it, when you see it in the news, when you see it on social media, when, when you see it going on in front of you, you go, hey, that's not right. Somebody should, they shouldn't feel that way. Somebody needs to do something about that. Hey, everybody, look over here. This is not okay. We, something needs to be done. What is it that stirs that up inside of you? What is it that breaks your heart? This question, this question is the gateway to purpose. This question is the door that when we start to ask this question, it will start to crack, and where it leads to is purpose. And we need to wrestle with this question and we need to figure this out because the thing is that our culture has lied to us so much. Our culture has led us in the wrong direction and rightfully so because if they lead us in this other direction, the direction that a lot of us go, I mean, think about it. They get rich off of us. 
That's what, they, that's, that's, that's what they get out of it. They can lead us in this direction, and we'll buy what they're selling, and we'll spend our hard-earned money on it, and we'll give our time and our energy to it. And so people have used this, culture has used this to profit off of us and to use us. And the thing we said last week, what this looks like, is chasing happiness, right? And here's the thing, though. If you chase happiness, you'll miss purpose. And so the thing we said last week is we want to kind of turn that around. Because you chase happiness, you'll miss, miss purpose. But the other, if you turn that around, you chase purpose, and what happens is, is you'll find happiness. Because if, you, if you, all you do is chase happiness, this sends you on a doom loop, okay? It's a doom loop. And, and you know exactly what this looks like. A doom loop, chasing happiness, what happens is, is you, you win. You get something, just like how my friend described last week. You, you get something. You get married. You get kids. You have a family, and that's great, and you feel like a winner for some time, but then it's not good enough. Well, now, I can't just have kids. I can't just have a family. We need them to have the best, the best experiences, the best trips, the best things. I I have a fear of them missing out, so then we ramp it up, right? They they deserve the world. I'll do anything for my kids. So we, we ramp it up even more, and so we start to add things to the schedule, start to add things, we start to spend money, we start to figure ways to work it out where we can make all the things and, and be at all the things and stuff, and then we start to win a little bit, and like things are good and stuff, and people start to notice, and we notice, but then, it, then it's not enough. So then, again, we feel like a loser, so we got we to gotta do more. Okay, well, we need to sign up for some more stuff. We need to buy some more things. We need to invest in some, th- some things. You know, the house that we had, it's not good enough anymore. We need a newer. We need to upgrade. We need to change some things. Let's, well, we need to go on a trip. Well, you know, so again, we ramp it up, we ramp it up, and it just kind of continues. And again, if you're my age, you start to get to your 30s and your 40s, and you start to acquire and acquire and acquire and start to be more responsible and more responsible and more responsible. And then you add more balls, and all the balls, you're, you're juggling them in the air, and you start to wear all the hats, not just a father and not just a spouse, but I'm this and I'm this. Oh, and I'm this every once a month, and then I'm this, and, this, and it starts to go, and here's what happens. Things just start to build and build and build, and it's never good enough, is it? You're never quite done. You're never at the point where you're like, hmm, I think we're done. No, it's always, well, one more thing. Well, it's not that often. Well, it's not that big of a commitment. It's not that big of a deal. But here's the thing. As things start to grow and grow and grow and you become more and more responsible and you have to manage more and more and more, what begins to build up inside of you is an insecurity. You ever felt that insecurity of not feeling like a good enough parent? of not being a good enough spouse, of not being a good enough friend. And all of a sudden, that insecurity starts to build and build and build. And here's what insecurity leads to. Insecurity will lead to fear. And again, none of you would ever admit to me that you're fearful. If I said, yeah, you ever get afraid? You go, oh, no. Because again, your daddy was Ricky Bobby, right? You ain't afraid of nothing. You're not afraid? No, I'm never afraid. But the truth is, is you are. And I can tell because of the way you act and the way you spend, and the way you sign up for stuff. Because there's a fear inside of you. And the fear is, is I'm afraid of what others think. I'm afraid of not being enough. I'm afraid of missing out. I'm afraid of being undesirable. I'm afraid of losing what I've gained. And here's the thing, if you're a parent, this list doubles up. Because you're afraid of your kids missing out. You're a kid, you're afraid of your kids not being desirable. You're afraid, and we're all afraid. We we, we hold that fear. And and the bottom line is this. We are afraid that we're not enough. What if I'm not enough? But here's, here's the thing that maybe nobody has ever told you that you need to know. If you're afraid of not being enough, not being good enough, here's the honest answer. You're not You're not and you never will be. It doesn't matter what accolades you have. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how many stellar trips you plan. It doesn't matter how many championships you win. You're not going to be enough for you. Because God didn't build you that way. You 
are not enough to fill yourself up. You could do all of the work on you. You could pump all of the weight and get all of the muscles and make all of the money and do all of the things and have such a stellar Instagram and it wouldn't matter. That hole that you feel would still be there. That hole that is gaping is still going to exist because God did not create you to be enough to fill yourself up. You're going against the design that you were created for because it was never supposed to come from within. And the thing is, Jesus' warning that you're going to see today, the reason we're talking about this, Jesus would warn us that you, you will use yourself up trying to fill yourself up. And we've seen this. Again, our series, after this series, is going to be about burnout. Because some of you are burnt up. And you know exactly what I'm talking about? That feeling of when you get burnt up, where you go, oh my gosh. If you're, if you're burned up, here's what you'll say. I just, when's vacation? I just need to get away. We're just so looking forward to this. I just, I just need, I just need, I just need, I just need. If you're there, you're burning yourself up. And one of the reasons you're burning yourself up is because you are trying so hard to feel, fill yourself up. But Jesus, he offers an alternative. He offers this paradox that, again, if you don't know what a paradox is, it's something that when you read it, it doesn't make sense. But when you put it into work, it makes perfect sense because it works. And so Jesus, he's going to offer us this alternative today. And at the bottom line of what Jesus says is he says this, filling is achieved through emptying, gaining is achieved through giving, and winning is achieved through losing. So let's dive into this today. What, what Jesus does in, in Mark uh, he has all of these followers. This is at the height of his popularity. He has the disciples. He's got all these followers. Everywhere he goes, he's got this huge crowd, and everybody loves Jesus. And so Jesus sees that he's got a lot of people who are just in it for themselves and that really aren't getting it. And so he decides that he's going to thin the herd by offering a challenge to them. And so Peter was there. Peter saw it. Peter told it to Mark. Mark wrote it down. That's where we get it from in the Gospel of Mark. So in your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, this is what the story is that's told. Jesus says this. He says, then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said this. So he says, hey, everybody, come here. I want to talk to you. Everybody who wants to hear, everybody who wants to listen, let me, let me explain something to you. So he calls them all together, and then this is what he says. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. And he's not talking about a disciple like in the sense of the 12. He's talking about being a follower. He's basically saying, hey, if you want to be a citizen of my kingdom, part of what I'm doing, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you are going to have to deny yourselves. You're going to have to say no to something. And then this is what he says next. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is kind of hard for us to understand because crosses today in our culture are so different. You know, crosses, you know, some of us, we have tattoo crosses. We have cross necklaces. Like, crosses are pretty to us. And it's like our way to identify with Christianity. But back then, if you saw somebody with a cross, it was somebody who had given up part of themselves. They had basically laid their life down, laid down their agenda and, and part of their identity. And basically, that's what Jesus is saying. He goes, hey, if you, if you want to be my follower... If you want to be one of mine, you're going to have to say no to yourself. You're going to have to abandon your agenda, and you're going to have to embrace my agenda. You're going to have to say no to you and what you want to do and what you want, and you're going to have to say yes to me and my way and what I want. And then he goes on, and he says this, and then this is the paradox, okay? This is the thing that makes zero sense, but it's going to make sense. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. So you see how that's a paradox, how that really doesn't make sense? Uh, okay, so if I want to save my life, okay, my first question is, save myself from what? I will lose it. What do you mean lose it? Are you talking about like death or I'm going to have to die? Like it doesn't make sense. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Well, here's the thing. There's something going on here. So 
in, in the Greek, the original uh, text that this was written down in, when it, when it gets to that lose it, there, there's a Greek word there that's a play on words. It's, it's apolumi. Everybody say that with me. Ready? Apolumi. There you go. You learned a little Greek today, okay? But it says apolumi. And apolumi, what it means is to ruin or destroy, to abandon, to miss out on. So what he's saying there is he's saying if you want to save your life, again, save myself from what? We're going to get there in a second. If you want to save yourself, you will ruin your life. Again, paradox, right? Doesn't make any sense. But Jesus is creating this formula, this cause and effect, reaping and sowing. He's saying if you want to save your life, you will choose to lose your life. If you want to save your life, you will choose to ruin your life. Your life. You will choose to destroy your life. Now, here's the thing about this whole reaping and sowing cause and effect thing. If, if, if ruining your life causes you to save your life, then the inverse is true as well. That that means also that this, there's two truths here. That that also means whoever clings to their life ends up ruining themselves. Now, here's the thing. I don't even need to explain to you what that looks like because you've already seen it. I mean, all of us have seen people who have clung to their life, who have made it all about them, who have chose to win, win, win no matter what, and they don't really care who's in the way, and they've been so about themselves that they have end up destroying themselves, destroying their relationships, destroying their reputation, and ending up plowing through people in the process. Anybody here ever been divorced or parents have been divorced? It, isn't it true that in that relationship, when it ended, that there was one person or sometimes both people who just were all about themselves, that the reason that they broke up is that one person was all about them. And they did whatever they wanted to do. They spent however they wanted to spend. They made decisions without the regard of anybody else. Some of you who were the kids and you saw your parents go through that, I mean, some of you, you you're begging your mom, you're begging your dad, leave him. Please leave him. He is selfish. He makes it all about him. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about us. He is all about himself, right? Or maybe you've had a friend who has been like this, where your friend, it, it, they are all about themselves. All they care about is, is themselves. It's when they call you or they talk to you, it's just because they want something from you. That's their agenda. It's always their agenda. It's always what they want. It's always what's best for them. It doesn't really matter what anybody else wants or what anybody else thinks. And we have, a, we have a phrase that describes people like this. They are people who are full of them selves. But here's the thing. People who are full of themselves, if we could crack them open and look, they are actually very, very empty inside. They are full of nothing. They are empty. And, and Jesus goes on and he's, he talks about this. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But Whoever loses their life for me. Again, he's talking about this whole loss thing. What do you mean lose? You mean like death? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, if you want to be my disciple, do you want to be with me? Do you want to be one of my followers? Yes. Okay, well then here's what it will take. To save your life, you will have to lose it. You will have to choose to lose. Lose out. You will have to choose like you're, you're like, Jesus hadn't modeled this yet, but if Jesus were here today, he would say, in the same way that I gave up my life for you, you're you're going to have to give up a portion of your life for the sake of somebody else. You're going to have to lose out. You're going to have to take your resources and your time and part of yourself, and you're going to have to spread it like seed that's scattered amongst the world. You're going to have to use that, and you're going to have to share a portion of your life. But that's only part of the equation. He's not talking about just being more generous or doing good for other people. Because then after that, he says this. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel. Now, again, this, the, the, 
this has been butchered by pastors so much in the past. I, I've sat through sermons where a pastor has used this to bring up martyrdom, right? And to say like, and that's why you gotta stand up for the gospel, right? Y'all, you're gonna have to lose and you're gonna need to stand up for your beliefs and they've politicized it a little bit and been like, and that's why you need to vote this way this, this year. You know, stand up for your beliefs and fight the system. That, that's, that's a terrible explanation of this verse, okay? Bad, bad pastor, bad, okay? That is not cool. That is not what he's talking about. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you wanna be one of my followers, you're gonna have to give up a portion of yourself for the sake of somebody else. But when you do it, you don't do it for your own glory. You don't do it for your own praise. What he's saying is this. Being Christian means giving your life away in some capacity in the name of the gospel. Where we don't point to ourselves and we don't take the pat on the back and we don't take the praise. But we point to the one whom it's from. It's when people thank you for doing something for them or being generous or donating something or giving something. And it's not you going, that's right, thank you very much. I am great, acknowledge me. No, it's pointing to the one who should be acknowledged. It's pointing to the one whom it comes from. An old school way to explain this. I love this. I have friends who still do this to this day. Sometimes I got pastor friends. Sometimes, you know, again, a lot of pastors, they greet people when they leave and stuff. And somebody will say, you know, uh, you know, great, great sermon, great pass, you know, great, 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 good job today. And I'll have friends who will say this, to God be the glory. It's a great, I've, I've heard this growing up in churches and stuff, and I love this. They'll say, you'll give them praise, and you're trying to thank them, but they point to him. They acknowledge him. They said, to God be the glory. Or, or another modern way to say this is, God is good. And again, I, I, I don't have the maturity to do that yet. I did it even this morning. People are like, good sermon. I'm like, thanks. You know, but it's pointing to him. To God be the glory. God is good. It's pointing to the one whom it came from. Jesus talks about this multiple places on his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about this. He says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may say, see your good deeds. And then here's what he wants to happen. And glorify your Father in heaven. Be a light. Glor- do good deeds. It's not enough to just believe good things. You've got to do good things in this world for the sake of other people. But when they thank you and when they look to you, point to the one whom it's from. To God be the glory. He is the reason for this. I, I said this last week told a story about my daughter. My daughter did this awesome thing where she, she took care of a friend. She was very generous to a friend, and she did this. And again, everybody, I wrote this story on Facebook, and this was not the intention. Everybody on Facebook was in the comment sections going, oh, Olivia, she's so great. Olivia's such a good girl. Here's the thing. She's in the room, so she can hear this. Olivia is not a good girl, okay? I love you, sweetie. But she's not. She's just like every other kid. She has moments where she's selfish. She has moments that, you know, she's tempted. But here's the thing. The reason Olivia did what she did, the reason Olivia knew to do what she did is because she has a great church and she serves a great God. It's not, it's not about my parenting. Trust me, Kate and I didn't teach her that. <laughs> it, it's, it's because of him. It's not possible without him. This week, when we responded the way we responded to the situation at the mobile food market, it's not because you have such a great pastor or you have such a great leadership team and staff that you know we're just such great, kind, humble, merciful people, and we just love being taken advantage of. No. My first instinct was like everybody else. Let's grab our, port, our, 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 our forks and kill her. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> take her to the town square and burn her. You know? I mean, I, that's not that... <laughs> I, prom, I don't know where that voice even came from, all right? Um, <laughs> but, like, it's not natural for me to respond that way. Do you know why I was able to respond that way? It's because of him. Because God is good. I would not have responded that way unless he had taught me how to respond that way. And that's, that's what God is trying to do. That's what Jesus is trying to teach us in the middle of this. He's like, if you want to save your life... You will choose to lose your life. You will lose it. You will give up a portion of it. You will surrender to it. 
And you'll do it in the name of the gospel. You'll do it so that when people want to know, tell me where you learned that from. Tell me why in the world you would ever do that. That you point to the source so that they can know the light. So that they can know the Father. And then Jesus says this. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now again... You may have heard this sermon preached many different ways. And what is it that Jesus is trying to save us from? Again, if you grew up in my generation, it's hell, right? Hell, you're trying to save yourself from hell. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not. He's not talking about saving yourself from hell. You know, what he's, you know what Jesus is trying to save us from? Jesus is trying to save myself from myself. Because I... I am my greatest enemy. And when it comes to your life and what keeps you from truly winning at life and feeling like a winner, it's you. It's you who is your greatest enemy. Jesus is trying to save me from myself. And the thing he's trying to help us understand is that in order to win, in order to win, you have to Lose yourself. But it's not like how Eminem said. You can't fill that hole that is gaping by winning. You, you can't fill that hole by more appreci- getting, doing more things to earn people's appreciation and admiration and stuff. That, that is a doom loop. If you do that, you will have nothing to show at the end of it but yourself. You will end up ruining yourself. But instead, he offers us an an alternative. And the thing he's trying to help us understand is this, is that the fullest, the fullest people, the, the, the fullest people, the happiest people, the most mature people, the most content people, the people who are most ready to, to handle things in life, like things that happen at the mobile food market, or like Olivia handled when her friend needed some answers and needed some guidance and needed some love, the fullest people The fullest people that you and I know and the fullest people that we look up to, the fullest people we know are the emptiest of themselves. If there's a person that you admire, if there's a person that you look up to, if we could crack them open, what we would see is they they have found ways to give up a portion of themselves for the sake of other people. And they don't take the glory and they don't take the credit. They point to the one whom it came from. To God be the glory. So, let me ask you a question. The question that you and I need to wrestle with is, where are you choosing to be a loser? Where are you choosing to lose? Where are you giving up a portion of yourself Where are you emptying yourself? Where you're not self-serving yourself, but you are giving, you're surrendering, you're laying it down for the sake of others. If we could figure this out, if we could figure this out, it would unlock so many things. And and, And I think it begins with the question, again, that we've been wrestling with. What breaks your heart? If you could figure out what breaks your heart, if you could figure out what breaks your heart, it is the gateway to purpose. If you can figure out what breaks your heart, you will know where you can begin to empty yourself for the sake of other people. And if you would begin to empty yourself for the sake of other people, you would find yourself being more full. Not only would you find yourself being full, but you would be able to save yourself from yourself. What is it that breaks your heart? I've been amazed at all of the conversations that I've, I've been able to have this week with people as you've wrestled with this question. Um, somebody, somebody messaged me this week. Well, actually, it came out of the mobile food market because we had, we had more volunteers than we've ever had at the mobile food market, which is fantastic. It's how we were able to serve so many families at a, such a record pace. But there were several people who were there that told me. You know, the only reason I'm here is because this is what breaks my heart. When you said that on Sunday and you said, well, we got the mobile food market, seeing people have to go through this, this, this is what breaks my heart. So I felt like I had to be here. And there were people who were, gave vacation time to be here and took PTO time to be here. I mean, it's incredible. My wife this week, 
my wife this week, she, she, we got in the car after service. She goes, I hated that message on Sunday. I said, to God be the glory. You know, I can use it both ways. <laughs> I don't have to take credit, but also if you hate it, you should email him because he's the one who gave it. Anyway, uh, but she said, I hated, hated that message. And I know this has broken my wife's heart. She goes, I hate that message. I think I gotta text Ashley. I think I'm supposed to be a small group leader for some of the teenagers on Wednesday nights. And so my wife went to youth group on Wednesday night and she was a small group leader and she's gonna be on the next serve schedule. I had somebody else message me who's single and they said, you know, here's what breaks my heart and here's the thing that, I've, that God has been telling me. In order for me to respond to what breaks my heart and for me to empty out myself and do something about this, I'm gonna have to continue to be single and I, I can't focus on dating right now in relationships. I can't have both. And so I'm gonna choose for, for the time being to continue to be single so that I can pursue what breaks my heart and because I, I wanna do something for this because this really bothers me. That's one of the bravest things I've ever heard. I'm not mature enough to do that. Somebody else, they messaged me this week and they said, you know, I, what breaks my heart is just people who don't know Jesus. I, I feel like coming to Anchored Hope, I just I feel like so much has been revealed to me and it's so awesome. I want everybody to experience this. I've been trying to invite all my friends and I want them to have access to all of this stuff and I want them to have a great experience. And, you know, with all that said, that's, that's why I feel like I, I need to start tithing. I need to start taking a portion of my income and giving it away for the sake of somebody else. I haven't been participating at all, and I feel really bad about that because this is my church, and I want to support it. And so I know your mission is to inspire people to follow Jesus. You're doing, you're answering, we're collectively answering what breaks my heart. And so, man, I, I need to start tithing. How can I do that? You know what? That's something that every single one of us could start to do today. If what breaks your heart is people who are in a self-destructive path, away from God, and they're dealing with what we've been talking about, every single one of us can help this thing grow and get the word out and get the message out and provide great experiences where people can learn and be inspired to follow Jesus. That's what, that's what your partnership through tithing looks like. What breaks your heart? Where is it going to start where you get on the path where you're no longer chasing happiness, but instead you're pursuing purpose? I want to promise you, if you would start to pursue purpose, you will find happiness. You will start to feel full. Now, for any of you that are here or watching or listening online, and you're not a Christian, you're probably thinking to yourself, you've been thinking to yourself this entire message, well, finally, somebody said it. Because I tell you what, my experience with these quote-unquote Christians is that they are all about themselves. Actually, they are some of the most for-themselves people that I have ever met. And I'm, I'm finally glad that somebody's saying it because I don't know much about Jesus, but I'm pretty sure that what you just said is how Jesus was, and I thought that's all, all of the Christians were supposed to act. You know, that whole Christian like Christ, I thought that's how they were supposed to be. So I'm, I'm so glad that somebody finally said something about it. And you're right. And on behalf of the church, I apologize because we haven't always gotten it right. And maybe that for you has been an excuse of why you've chosen not to follow Christ. But here's what I would say to you. We don't always get it right. But Jesus did. And because he did, he's worth following. And so, if that inspires you, I think that you should follow Jesus. I think that Jesus would be something that would help you save yourself from yourself. For every single one of us, I hope that you figure out whatever it is that breaks your heart. Because if you would figure this out, you would find a place to begin to lose yourself. That you could empty yourself into something that is much greater and much bigger than yourself. And that will have you feeling full. That will bring the appreciation, the admiration, the love, the peace, the humility that you are desperately, desperately looking for. Let me pray for you this morning. Father God, 
as we come to you today. I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, modeling this for us, for explaining this to us, for caring about us enough to help us save ourselves from ourselves. God, would we follow you through this? Would we follow you out of our selfish ways? The emptiness that we feel inside, would you fill it with purpose? And God, would we find a place to empty ourselves in order to make this world a better place, but to, to be your light in the darkness? And would we, through our giving and through our generosity and through our actions, point people to you? Because just as that song that we sang earlier, you are good. You are good. And God, your goodness is so incredible and so, so, so mighty that, God, it's worth sharing to the world. So help us to do that through our actions and our deeds this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Kezia and the band are going to come back and they're going to lead us in worship. And this last song that we picked, um, it's all about surrendering. It's all about laying it down. And you know, really, that's the first act, the, the first decision that you can make this morning.